أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله سبحانك لا إله إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم وصلى الله مع سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله this is a, a third online class related to the the seerah through the Quran although for those that are here in Glasgow uh, this is a continuation of our regular class um, which started uh, some some months ago and in the last class uh, we talked about the we went over the verses in Surah the Safa which talked about the the occasion where Sayyidina Ibrahim was asked or commanded through a dream to slaughter his son Sayyidina Ismail and uh, I'm not going to, obviously I'm not going to go over the whole lesson, but there were three points that I tried to make at the beginning. One was related to the question of identity and how this story was uh, used uh, in particular during the in in Holland in the, when when the government were trying to or elements of the government were trying to uh, ban the, the ritual slaughter, any ritual slaughter, which included the the, the kosher slaughter according to Jewish rights and the halal slaughter according to Islamic rights. And they, the communities came together to use this story to, to identify, to say that, that, um, ritual slaughter is actually part of our identity. Uh, and I tried to point out in the last lesson that that's not actually true and that the slaughter here is not to do with the killing of meat or the killing of an animal, uh, but rather to do with one's relationship with one's Lord. Um, and I particularly wanted to quote the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَنْ يَنَالُ اللَّهُ لُحُومَهَا وَلَا دِمَاؤُهَا وَلَا كِيَنَالُ تَقْوَى He says that meat, the meat of the slaughter, in the Hajj in particular is referring to, doesn't reach him, nor does the blood, rather what reaches him is the uh, the righteousness related to this. So we talked a little bit about that. We talked about how actually when we talk about the, the pillars of Islam and how that story and the concept behind it, it isn't actually the Hajj that's, uh, that's crucial here in terms of the progression of human, human, uh, relationship with, with ritual slaughter, but actually what replaces ritual slaughter in this concept is zakat, purification, because the story is about the purification of one's heart. Uh, and the third point I uh, introduced was the hadith where the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is reported to have said, Ana ibn Dhabihaini, I am the, the one, the son of the two that were slaughtered. Um, and we, we talked a little bit about how uh, a particular scholar who um, many people think is a, uh, an outright authority on everything to relate to hadith, rejects this hadith. However, that uh, shouldn't um, necessarily be the, be the case. And I mentioned other hadith which support it. And uh, again, um, one of those is related to uh, al Bari. And if people want to re refer to that, they, they can. So that's what, the, what we, we talked about last week. And the week before that, we talked about how the Prophet Ibrahim and his son Ismail were um, their migration to Mecca or their visit of Mecca where he he left his son and daughter his was saying Ibrahim the prophet Abraham left his son and daughter son and mother and their mother his mother there in Mecca um, as a result of that the, the the Zamzam gushed forth the well of Zamzam gushed forth so combining those two stories um, that we, we related to from the Quran, I wanted to bring it into the context of the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the significance of those events that took place in the life of Ibrahim, the Prophet Abraham, and how they are reflected uh, prior to the birth of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a preparation for the coming of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the re-establishment of the method and the religion and the way of our Prophet and Father Sayyidina Ibrahim, the, the Abraham the Patriarch. So, um, and then hopefully if we have time, 
uh, before Maghrib here in Scotland, uh, I may hopefully return back to the story of Sayyidina Ibrahim and to the tafsir of the verses related to that story, in particular Surah Al-Baqarah from verses 124 to approximately 128. We won't cover all of them, but we might touch on them. So if anybody wants to 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 to, to bring those up that's, um, or draw on those, and for those who are part of the WhatsApp group here in Glasgow, their notes, those notes should have been sent out to them, inshallah. So let's go back to, to how it relates to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, in particular, the the hadith that I, I mentioned, Ana ibn al-Bihayn, I am the son of the two that were slaughtered. Um, and of course, the first one he's referring to is that he's a descendant of the Prophet Ismail, who was commanded to, who was, who his father was commanded to sacrifice him. And of course, we told the story in full last week, uh, and that Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, replaced him with a fidya, uh, with a, a, a ransom, so to speak, where he was exchanged, and that the, the command that, um, he, that, that was placed upon it, the Prophet Abraham, Sayyidina Ibrahim, was fulfilled. So how does that relate to the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So partly what we need to do is we need to think about, first of all, about the Zamzam and how, um, what happened to the Zamzam after uh, Ismail um, and his mother found it. Uh, or it was re it was shown to them by or by the the angel Jibril, um, by Say by Sayyidina Jibril. So, okay, what happened was that as we as we finished the story two weeks ago, um, the, the 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 birds circulated and then dripped down to the water indicating that there was life and there was well there was water there and a tribe that was passing by from from the yemen that made this regular journey from the yemen to syria passing through mecca they passed there they saw the birds they joined them uh and they this tribe Jur, the tribe of Jurham, uh recognized um the greatness of this event they recognized the 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 magnitude of a, a, a woman alone in the desert with a baby and being blessed with this water. So they um, provided for her, uh, gave her some support in terms of helping her to build a small home. And in return, she they asked her to look after the well and to keep the connection for whenever they, they passed by. So this tribe of Jurham um, passed by on a regular basis um, and uh, had this very strong connection with, with Sayyidina Ismail. And indeed, what happened was that his second wife, no, his, his wife from whom he had children, um, was from this tribe. And this is this is relevant in that this lineage is referred to in the verses that we're going to be reading later in the, in, in the Dars. So Ismail married a, a girl from the tribe of Jur Jurham, and um, as a result of this um, connection and the well being there. That the tribe of Jurham in particular um, had a connection to this 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 the, the sacred sanctuary, and Sayyidina Ismail um, married into that tribe and had a, a son called Nabit, um, uh, Nabit ibn Ismail, and from the offspring of Nabit ibn Ismail come the, all of the lineage of the 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 tribes related descending from Ismail. So among those of course is the tribe of Quraysh um uh, and, uh who who eventually settle and and um build around the, the city of Mecca and uh, the, the the sacred house and then the city of Mecca. However when the Prophet Prophet said Ismail died he was then um uh, blessed by the son Nabit ibn Ismail who looked after the sanctuary, looked after the home that Sayyidina Ismail had lived in, uh, where he was now buried, the, the grave of Sayyidina Ismail, the grave of Sayyidina, Sayyidina uh, Hajar, and the well and the trade that was connected to passing through the, the, this holy site. So for a long time this holy site was uh, blessed uh, by, the, the, by, the, the, by, the, by Ismail, 
with the offspring of Sayyidina Ismail. But not only that, by all Arabs and the children of Bani Israel. And of course, Bani Israel descend from the brother of Sayyidina Ismail, from uh, the brother of Sayyidina Ismail. Ismail, at the end of the story, as we mentioned last week, that uh, Ibrahim, the Prophet Abraham, was given the glad tidings that he would have another son, and that son was to be Ishaq, and Ishaq was Ba'd Ishaq, uh, Ya'qub. Ya'qub's other name is Israel. So the children of Israel, the children of Ya'qub, are the descendants of, Is of Ibrahim and the cousins of Sayyidina Ismail. And the, in the Jewish texts and um, uh, the, the Torah, and of course the, 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 that which appears in, in the Bible and in the Psalms, refer to this sacred house. And I'll, I'll read where it says, from the Psalms 8, Psalm 84, it says, Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the ways of them who passing through the valley of Baca make it a well. So this refers to Baca is another name for Makkah. Baca is the valley, the sacred valley. And even today, the, the, the city of the, the valley of Makkah is sometimes still referred to, referred to as Baca. But there's, there's a lot of discussion about that. And that particular, um, uh, Psalm, uh, recognizes the well that springs forth in the desert in the sacred valley of Bakka, and most people understand it to be referring to the the the, the, the well of Ismail. However, the the uh, sort of interpretation, um, the Christian interpretation in particular, says that the story is not really the, the Bakka is not supposed is not to be taken literally, and the physical position of Mecca and the position of the story of Bakka is take second place to the spiritual story. In other words, that Ismail is not that, you know, the whole story of Ismail being in the desert and all of that sort of stuff is not that relevant. However, to us, it is, it is extremely significant, especially because before that, it refers to the tabernacle. So when the, the, the children of Bani Israel were in the Exodus, it refers to the, the, the tabernacle is the, the, the tent of, of the prayer tent of the, of the children of Israel when they were in in their exodus from the holy land and it refers to the the to this being connected to the to the city of to the Bakka to the valley and it's by the blessing of the Bakka and the blessing of the tabernacle that this 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 union brings forth the well and even if we take the the, the christian interpretation which says that we should focus on the spiritual elements of this or the 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 the, 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 the symbolic elements of the well then I'm fine with that because the symbolic element of the well is extremely relevant. And if we understand the story of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam through the, the the symbolism of the well, we will see how that that this can reconnecting with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam will be reconnecting with the well that springs forth from this story. And of course, he comes in the month of Rabi al Awwal, and Rabi al Awwal is called the first spring. So th there's a lot of symbolism around this. So let's go back to the story. So the well was there. It was looked at, looked after by Satan Ismail. It was looked after by his son Nabit ibn Ismail and was for many, many generations was recognized as a spiritual center and magnet for all the righteous people from the Arabs and from the children of Israel, uh, the children and uh, all of the, it was, it was a magnet. And the reasons why were two, one was the Kaaba was there, and the other was the, the, um, the sacred water, the well of Zamzam. However, I mentioned the tribe of Jurham. Now, Jurham is not, uh, was not, uh, necessarily, uh, all, not all of them were as righteous and, and, um, uh, uh spiritually inclined and, and wholesome, so to speak, as, the, the the wife of Sayyidina Ismail, and uh, in particular her uncle um, Mudad ibn Amr, um, who was established in the Yemen, um, was not was would do nadalik as we will say in Arabic. He was not one of those people of the righteous. So he, when he heard when there was drought in the Yemen and there was difficulties in the Yemen, he then returned. He came to Mecca. And he settled, and at the, the death of Nabit ibn Ismail, the son of Ismail, Jurham, or in particular this uh, Mudad ibn, uh, ibn Amr, al-Jurhami, he then 
they Jurham tribe took over. However, as I said, they didn't have the same respect, they didn't have the same love. And also by this time, by this time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed the city of Mecca with a number of small wells all around. So this was a, a not the symbolism here is that wells are growing and, and, and flowing. Some of the scholars have said there were twelve wells, and there's significance in this perhaps when we get to the to talking about the twelve offsprings of of, of the twelve children of Israel being being the fountains by which the children of Israel drink. Likewise, there were 12 wells uh, and, and there's, a, there's a lot of significance to that, but, but perhaps uh, we can go into further detail on, on another occasion. Um, but for, suffice for us to say is that it was a magnet, spiritual magnet. However, when Jurham introduced idolatrous practices and they introduced um, uh, discord between two brothers, one who lived in the valley, one who lived in the in the in, in the in the mountain of Kay Kay um, This this discord was built around Makkah, and the purity of the well and the purity of the house was only maintained by the blessing of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. However, when it got to a point where the Bani Israel did no, no longer recognize Bakr as a sacred place where most of the righteous Arabs, righteous descendants of Ismail, they could see that what was happening was that the, 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 the symbol of truth and the symbol of their connection to the Prophet Ibrahim was being torn by idolatrous practices, by wrongdoing, by, by corruption. They were, the only reason they didn't rise up was because of the mother and the, the mother of Nabit and the wife of Sayyidina Ismail, uh, and out of respect for, for this family, they didn't rise up. However, in the end, they had to rise up. And um, they did and overthrew the, tr the tribe of Jurham. However, when Jurham left, what they did is they buried the well of Zamzam. They covered, they took all of the wealth that had been uh, deposited there, um, uh, as gifts to, to, to the sacred house and to the keepers of the sacred house. They threw this into the well of Zamzam, clogging it up. They, they covered it up and so that no one knew where the well of Zamzam, uh, was. And for generations, this flowing, um, water that's described in the Psalms of David, that's described in the, in the, in the, uh, in the Quran here, in the, in the, in the Hadith, this was cut off for generations. And that symbolism is very, very important because when it's re-established is in shortly before the um, um, birth of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it was in the time in particular of his uh, grandfather, uh, 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 Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib. Now Abdul Muttalib, um, uh, how he, he first of all that wasn't his uh, his real name his real name was Sheba, um, uh, uh, Sheba meaning a, a gray hair, and he was a young child when his father died, Sayyidina Hashim, and his wife, uh, the wife of Sayyidina Hashim, the mother of Abdul Muttalib, had said that he she put into a contract into the wedding contract that if her husband were to die she was to keep the son and she was to take him back to uh, her own tribe of Bani Najjar, which was in later to the, what was later to be known as Yathra, uh, Mad Al Medina. So Sayyidina Hashim had this son, Sheba, and he died shortly after that. So when, um, the child, when he died, uh, when Hashim died, um, Sayyidina Salma took the baby to Yathra, to, uh, what is now known as Medina, and, um, Alhamdulillah, he grew up there. However, Hashim was one of these uh, great people who united all of the Arab tribes, all of the communities. Um, and there's a particular story of how he fed um, a, a, a large number of, of, the, of, of people um, in a time of famine. And that's how he actually got his name Hashim, which, which means to the one that breaks bread into, um, into soup. So this son grew up in Al Medina and his father who had ruled Mecca in a um, with mercy, with gentleness, but at the same time unifying all the people, the town fell to pieces after he died. And his only son, this young boy, grew up in Al Medina. 
uh, Yedrib, as, as it was known in those days. As chaos flew through, um, started to in, in, in get introduced into the tribes of Quraysh, what happened was that um, Muttalib, the brother of Hashem, decided that perhaps this young boy might be the one that unites them. So he went to the city of Yedrib, asked Sayyidatina Salma, please, please, we're desperate for you to give us the baby back, the boy back. And if you do, we're sure that he will, will grow to be a great leader. So he brought, she brought him, eventually he, she agreed. He came back on the, on the, the beast of, uh, said some say the, the donkey, the mule of, of, or the horse of Sayyidina Hashim, the uncle of the, the, his uncle. And they said, Oh, Muttalib has got a new, has got a new, um, slave boy. Um, because they, no one knew who, who this boy was. And Abdul Muttalib is the slave of Muttalib. So he got this nickname, this name Abdul Muttalib. Anyway, that's who, who he was. So he grew up in the city uh, as a child in the city of Medina. And then as a teenager and as an adult, he was in the city of Mecca. And one day he was sleeping in, in the Hijra of Ismail, the house with Sayyidina Ismail, uh, which is attached as part of the Kaaba, part of the holy house. He was sitting there, lying there, asleep. And this was his want. He used to, to spend a lot of time there. And one day he was sitting, he was lying there, half asleep, and he heard a voice. And the voice says, Ihfir Tayba. Dig the, um, dig the sweetness, Tayba. Dig sweetness. And he woke up, he says, what's Tayba? My Tayba. And he, the voice disappeared. What, whoever had said it had, had disappeared. So, um, uh, he left. Um, that and, but it still played on his mind. The next day he went to the same, slept as he was his norm. He heard the same, the same voice. He says, Ihfar Barra. Um, and Barra is, is, is means beneficence, gentleness, um, blessing. He says, dig this, dig Barra, dig, dig, dig beneficence, beneficence. So he woke and he says, what's beneficence? And the voice had gone. The third day, he said, he heard the same thing happen. He heard the verse, the, the voice saying, Ihfar Madnuna. Madnuna means the buried treasure. So now it's a clearer definition, but still he doesn't know what this is. And on the fourth day, the same thing happened. And this time he says, Ihfar Zamzam. And then he, he stood and he says, what is Zamzam? And then he heard a voice reciting these lines of poet, poetry. لا تف uh, لا تفسق أبدا ولا تذم تسقى الحجيج الأعظم وهي بين الفرث والدم عند قرية النمل. Um, so he said that um, this, the, the lines of this poetry mean, in, in effect, is that this well, it will never, it will never um, run out. It will always, it will never bring harm. It will always flow. And where is this? What will it do? It will tusqi al haji al hajij al adam. It will massive numbers of pilgrims will come and it will still uh, provide water for them. Wahiya bain al farthi wa dam, and it is between the stool of the of the of the animals and its blood. End the kariyat al namal, with by the literally the the village of the ants, meaning an ant hill. So. He heard all this and he knew there was something special here. Now we mentioned last week that when Sayyidina, Sayyidina Hajib was running between the, bet running between the, oh, so Barakale, between the, the hills of Saf and Marwa, um, that the Saf, Saf and Marwa are actually the two foothills of Abu Qais and Abu Qais, uh, uh, the, the two, the two mountains of which the valley is. And, Later, the tribe of Jurham placed idols on each, either one of these. One was called Asaf and one was called, um, from the name of the other, Naila. So these two, two idols were placed on the two, two hills, the two foothills. And people used to worship between, as uh, was the tradition, which was running between the two. And when they got to the middle, they would slaughter, um, their, their beasts to the, to the, to, to, to Naila or to, uh, Isaf, and um, and therefore this was a place where you'd have animal waste, you'll have blood, you'll have all kinds of things, and of course that attracts ants. So 
Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib went away. He he got uh, he called his son, his only son. This is very important. He called his only son, uh, who was called Harith. So he called Harith, and they they brought their um, uh, spades and they looked where this this hill might be, ant hill. They found it and they started to dig. And as they started to dig, people would look at what are these two crazy people doing. So it attracted a lot of commotion. And when they saw, some people thought it was sacrilegious and they tried to stop him. And he says, no, this is where the well is. This is where the Zamzam is. So they started to dig and they continued to. There was a point where they'd stopped trying to stop him. And in his heart, he had doubt. He looked and he realized that all around him were these strong, powerful men who had everything in terms of the wealth, in terms of trade. And although he had wealth and he'd been blessed, Arab communities were really measured, and still unfortunately are sometimes, by the number of sons that they have. And he only had this one son with him who was digging this well. And for a moment, there was a moment of doubt. Although um, he had had this very clear vision or very clear vision four times and immediately after he'd heard it the fourth time he he came he did tawaf he made his dua uh to to the one and only god and through that he'd got uh clear guidance in his heart that this is but for that moment he had doubt anyway he put it behind him he continued to dig and a hand of the water gushed forth so this zamzam was then a, associated with Abdul Muttalib. So Abdul Muttalib, whose father had united the Arabs, has now in a position to again unite the Arabs, which he does. And he brings all of the Arab tribes, and in particular, because he's the descendant of Sayyidina Ismail, what had happened was the descendants of Ismail, alhamdulillah, had been blessed and had gone to many different tribes around the, um, to the surrounding areas of Makkah. So through Makkah, this was this, this, as I said, was like a spiritual, political, economic magnet. And Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib became this leader. Now, I mentioned specifically that he, he prayed to the one God because every reference to Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib that, that you find in the Seerah and uh, it refers to him going to the Kaaba, and the, in particular when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is born, he, he he lifts the baby up and he says, "Aidu bil wahid." I I place him under the protection of the One God. Said Abdul Muttalib was a mutawahid, he was a muwahid from the wahidin, from the Unitarian people. So Abdul Muttalib, alhamdulillah, was blessed with the status. Now, um, why am I, uh, did I emphasize that point of doubt? Was because Alhamdulillah, the Zamzam is related to the story that we were talking about last week. And, oh, sorry, the week before. And the slaughter is related to the story we talked about last week, which was the, the, the command to slaughter Sayyidina Ismail. However, both of those are united in the grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One, he finds the Zamzam. Allah directs for this water to flow at the hands of the grandfather of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in pre preparation for the coming of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and for preparation for the return of the ultimate descendant of the Prophet Ibrahim Sallallahu uh, Ibrahim Alaihi Wasallam by establishing the rights of Sayyidina Ibrahim and the religion, the Millah of Sayyidina Ibrahim, which is why the Kaaba and the, 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 the Hajj and the Zamzam and the, going to Safa, going to Marwa, going to the place of the slaughter, which was Minna, uh, all of these things are so intrinsic to the, the Deen. But what's so, so, what's so important is it refers to a re, return to the Millah of the Prophet Ibrahim, who was not Makani Yahudiya Wala Nasraniya, he was not a Jew or a Christian, he was Kana Hanifa Muslima. And therefore the Prophet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that whoever does not perform the Hajj may as well die as a Jew or a Christian. What it means is they've moved away from the way of the Prophet Sayyidina Ibrahim. And if you as a Muslim reject the Hajj, 
or don't take mm -hmm. take care of it, then you may as well have gone in the same way because you're going away, not only from the way of Sayyidina Ibrahim, but the way of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when you make your, your tawaf, the first thing you do is you say, Allahumma iman and bikr. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, walillahi alhamd. Allahumma iman and bikr. Oh Allah, we believe you, iman and bikr. Wa tasdeekan bi ahadika. And we fulfill the covenant which you made with Sayyidina Ibrahim and the covenant which you made with Sayyidina Adam and his offspring, including us, when he said, Alas to be Rabbikum, you create that black stone, you say, Allah iman and bikwa tastiqan bi kitab wa fa'an bi ahdika wa itibami sunnita nabik and following your Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala millati abina Ibrahim Hanifa Muslim wa ma'akana min mushrikin. So you connect all of these three stories that we've covered over the last few weeks. Sayyidina, Sayyidina Adam, Sayyidina Ibrahim, Sayyidina Ismail, and now Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, they are combined. So we've seen that Sayyidina Ismail, uh, Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib brings forth or the water flows forth from, okay, the water flows, flows, flows forth from, um, at the hands of Sayyidina, Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib. He has this doubt for a minute about, um, his own status. And one of the points that brought him down was that he felt Allah has blessed him with wealth. Allah has blessed him with returning into leadership. Allah has blessed him with, with a tremendous, uh, beauty. Uh, there was one thing that was known about Sayyidina Abdul Muttalib that his mother, Sayyidina Salma, was the most beautiful woman in Al Medina, and his father, um, Sayyidina Hashim, was the most beautiful man in Makkah, and he descended from this. So he had this, this nur, this light on his face. But there was one thing, he only had one son, as I've mentioned. So he went back to the Kaaba, he did his tawaf, and he then begged. He says, just as you've granted me this blessing, grant me sons. And if, Ya Allah, you grant me ten sons, I will sacrifice one of them to you. And that's where the story of Ibn al-Bihaini comes from. So Alhamdulillah, this is what he was already... He, I wouldn't say old in years, but he, he had, you know, he wasn't a young man. Um, and to, to have 10 children, 10 male sons was, was really kind of saying, you know, it was not really likely, especially as he hadn't had sons previously. They, they, you know, it was, it was like a, an oath that was made. I wouldn't say in jest, but it was made as, as a more, um, rhetorical, um, than it was, uh, intended to be a, a, a real promise. Alhamdulillah, Allah blessed him. And the tenth son was called Sayyidina Abdullah. And Abdullah, when he when he was born, that feeling um, of great happiness was found in Abdul Muttalib. Why? Because of all his sons, Abdul Muttalib, Abdullah, his youngest son, had the most light. And it looked as if this light that had descended from Satan Ismail was finally in the 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 lin, in the lineage and through this child Abdullah. However, he was the youngest son, and his older sons had, had grown. Uh, and it said, according to the, the genealogy, that actually there was quite a distance in age between him and and, and the others. So he, at the time, the, the, Abdul Muttalib knew it was a rhetorical kind of thing that happened. It wasn't a, a, a command. So he let it go. He didn't sacrifice his son as the son grew older it kept coming back to him that he had made a promise to god and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has never let him down so when he he, he got to this point he realized that, that he has to do something about it so he called his children and and told them what had happened uh and they they said well if that's what you want then you promised to slaughter a son you didn't promise to slaughter your twelfth, tenth son. You promised to slaughter. I know you implied the tenth son would be, but they weren't your wording. So take any of us, uh, and so draw lots, as was the tradition of the Arabs. So that he called the, uh, I don't know what you would call them in England, the master, master, master of lots, who who kind of draws the lottery, so to speak. Um, and this, there was one person in, in the tribe of Quraysh. They, they called him, and they draw the lots and. Lo and behold, it fell on Abdullah. So he now, it was kind of confirmed that, that, that he has to slaughter his son, which he, he, he felt obliged to. So he told the other sons, he told his wives, 
that this is what he was going to do. Now, the wife, the mother of Sayyidina Abdullah was from the tribe of Bani Makhzum, who were a very powerful um, tribe uh, for those that study the Sira. They, they, they take a very prominent role. So when they found out um, that they had intended to slaughter um, Abdullah, who, who was beloved to them, obviously, through, 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 their, through his mother, they said, no, ransom him, just as Ismail was ransomed. We will give all of the wealth of Bani Makhzum in exchange for this, and we will give it to feed all the pilgrims and distribute it to all of the poor. And, uh, you know, God will do it. Don't worry about it. He says, no, this doesn't seem right to me. So he still didn't know what to do in his heart. So what he did as a result, he went back to his hometown because he knew there was a lady in the town of Yedru that he remembered as a child was a wise woman. So he went there to seek this woman to say, basically, how can I get out of this, this situation? He got to Al Medina, uh, Yedrib as it was called in those days, and she wasn't there. He traveled all of this way and it was a great difficulty for him. So he says, where can I find her? Oh, she's another two days journey to a town called Khaybar. So he went to the town of Khaybar and eventually he found her. And she says, okay, there's a, there is a solution to this. There, there will be a solution. What is the, the fidya, the blood money of the people of Quraysh? If you kill somebody by accident, what do you need to pay in exchange to the person? Uh, the blood wit. And the blood wit at that time was 10 camels. Um, so the 10, so he says, okay, draw lots. 10 camels on one lot and on the other is Abdullah. And if the camels are drawn and not Abdullah, slaughter 10 camels. And if Abdullah is drawn, then add another 10 camels until Abdullah's name is called. So he went back and he decided this is what he would do. He called people to the Kaaba. He called the, 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 the master of the lottery, so to speak. And they pulled this out. Camels. Add another 10. Camels. Add another 10. Camels. Add another 10. Camels. Till eventually there was 100 camels. And then Abdullah's name was pulled and he slaughtered 100 camels. Um, and that's the reason why there's a reference to um, this uh, Anna ibn of the Bihaini. And just, just to recap, because um, again, there might be people on here who might want to quote Albani, who says it's, it's a weak fabricated hadith. However, as I mentioned, there's an, another narration where uh, uh, Sayyidina Muawiyah mentions that a Bedouin, the desert Arab, came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he says, "Ya ibn of the Bihaini, O son of the two, the, the, the two, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, didn't uh, uh, correct him. He, he accepted this, and this is found in uh, Abu Naim, by, by, related by Abu Naim, Ma'rif to Sahaba, by Al Hakim al Mustadrak, uh, Tabrani in his Tafsir, and Ibn Hajar refers to it in his uh, commentary on." Uh, uh, Fatul Fath Bari, and as I mentioned uh, last week, Abdulaziz Al Ghumari he had a has a book which is called At Tibyan the Hadith in Ana Ibn the Bihani, a whole book about this uh, Hadith. Um, so if Albani is not is not happy with it, Alhamdulillah, no problem. Okay, so what what's the significance of this? I'm trying to bring together the two stories that we've read from Surah Al-Safa and uh, from Surah Al-Baqarah about and uh, Surah Al-Anbiya, which we talked about over these last two weeks, and to bring them to, to up to the point of how both those stories repeat themselves in preparation for the coming of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, let me return to the to the. Um, the verses that we were planning to study, and as I mentioned, those that are um, locally here in the, in the in a, among the Glaswegian students who have been studying this this class for some weeks, their notes have been sent out to them. And for those that I mentioned at the beginning, this is from Surah Al-Baqarah, verses 124 to 127. And this, uh, uh, inshallah, we'll read a few of those verses. Um, so the verse begins with Ibtala Ibrahim Qala inni ja'iluka nasi imama, qala wa min dhurriyati, qala wa la yanalu ahdil ahdil dhalimeen. And so that's uh, the first verse. And uh, uh, Yusuf Ali says, I remember that Ibrahim was tried by his Lord with certain commands. Um, so we mentioned this, this word ibtila several times uh, 
for the, for those the, the stu those those that studied in Glasgow uh, and the, the few that were studied on the online halakha. Um, and we went into detail about the concept of ibtila. And one of the meanings of ibtila is to make uh, clear al khair fi shay wa shar fi shay. To, to, to make clear this thing, because not always is good obvious. And sometimes, um, perhaps sometimes you dislike a thing, but it's actually good for you. So sometimes the only way that you can understand what is a khair is by it being tested. Now, here, Ibrahim, Rabbahu, when his Lord tested him, and um, we mentioned also the word Lord, Rabb, Rabb, um, according to um, uh, the, 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 one of the meanings of Rob is to make something grow, to, 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 to make something grow. So it's the provider and it's described as Rob Boucher is the one who makes it grow to Linukta Til Kamal, to the point of perfection. So obviously Rob Al Alameen is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the Rob of everything. So his Lord did Ibtila, tested Ibrahim, the Kalimatin, for by certain commands. And we went through the, what these commands were, and we've referred to two of them in the last few weeks for those that have joined us online. Um, as one of them was the abandoning of his son in the middle, in the desert, and the other is the slaughter of it, the, the command to slaughter his son. And he completed them. Right, there are three um, important points that I want to, 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 to reflect on when we look at this verse um, and, and how they relate to us. Because in the end, as we said previously, the concept of seerah is a journey. And this journey is the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I don't like to say the biography. I like to say the journey of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Take it literally. Why? Because this is a journey. Likewise, we are all on a seerah. We're all going, traveling a journey. And our journey should be understood in relation to the journey of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is described in the books of seerah, but as we're studying here, through the Quran. So understanding the Quranic verses here should ultimately lead uh, let us understand the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and relate it to the seerah of Abdul Aziz. What do I learn? What is my? How does my journey relate to this particular verse? And I'll tell you. What the Ibtala Ibrahim tests. First of all, Allah tested Ibrahim, and it's not a test because Allah didn't know that he was going to pass. The test was not for Allah. Allah knew the result, and it wasn't even for Satan Ibrahim. The real test is actually for the people listening to the verses so that we can understand the success of Sayyidina Ibrahim. That's why whenever the verses end is that it always and likewise we reward those who do good actions. So the purpose is to recognize that Ibrahim is our uswa, our kudwa, our example by which we learn. So that's the first point is that the test is not for um, Ibrahim, it wasn't for Abraham, it wasn't for Allah, it wasn't even for Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It was for me and for you. So he tells us these stories, so we can under that to stand up. There. That's the first thing, and of course he fulfilled the test for Ibrahim alidhi wafa, which is in Surah Najm. And indeed Ibrahim fulfilled those tests. What we, the second point, is that what was the test, and how does that particular test relate to us? We talked. Um, a lot last week about why, what were the emotions that were involved and why was the test so great upon Ibrahim was not because of the physical uh, the command to kill his own son, but was how does he relate to his Lord? Not about the slaughter, not about the child, not about the blood, not about the wheat. No, no, that's not. It's about how is his heart in relation to the command. Uh, uh, and uh, Atustari, when he's talking about this, so the scholars have said there were seven tests that Ibrahim was put through, and we went through these before for those in, that studied in Glasgow, uh, before the, when we went online. Hamba, we covered all of those, and the last two we covered online. So of these, the great, the real essence of the test, Ibtalullahu bihi Ibrahim alayhi salam, 
and hamalu afqal al khul al what was really was to test how he carried the responsibility of his unique affection and affectionate relationship with his Lord. Khul'a means that he was his Khalil. And the word Khalil is important because the town where he's buried is called Al-Khalil. And he is described uh, that Utakhad Ibrahim Khalil. And Allah took Ibrahim as his bosom buddy, his, his unique friend. Now, if you have a unique friend, then indeed the responsibilities of that friendship will fall on that person. And anybody that takes an, a, 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 a spiritual friend in any way, that relationship will be tested. And when it's tested, for example, Abu Bakr Siddiq, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he went on his Isra wal Mi'raj, they came straight to the Prophet said, Abu Bakr Siddiq, ah, now we've got you. You know what your friend said? Your pal, he said, your friend said this. He said that he traveled all the way to Jerusalem in one night and he did this and he did that. And he... How would Abu Bakr Siddiq say? If he said it, it's true. So this test of khul'a, of, 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 of the khul'a, to, khul'a the, 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 this closeness, will come to everybody that takes uh, 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 the step towards this intimate friendship. And of course, we've taken out, the story of this is about us taking the, 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 the prophets as an example, and that will bring about a test. Um, there's a man, that, a companion who came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, says, uh, well, uh, ya Rasulullah. indeed I love you, O Messenger of Allah. And then the, the, the man says, undur ila ma taqul. Prophet Sallallahu said to him, look, be careful about what you say. No, 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 I love you, Ya Rasul. He says, be careful about what you say. He says, Ya Allah, by Allah, I swear I love you, Ya Rasul. He says, nobody says this except that they're tested. So tie your knees. In other words, let's a very um, Arab camel herdsman type of statement. Tie the knees of the camel it means to strengthen the knees because they're going on a long journey. Because if you take that step, you will be tested. And I remember once uh, my, my teacher and, and mentor, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Malamali, may Allah be pleased with him and, and, and protect his family and, and Alhamdulillah who passed away uh, earlier this year. I remember one day out of the blue, as he, he often did, um, he looked at me and says, you're having a difficult time, huh? I says, yeah, a little bit, work is difficult. He says, remember, for every Musa there is a Fir'aun. Every Musa, there's a Fir'aun. In other words, if you take the way of the prophets, you will be tested. Because the friendship will be, um, your connection will be. And this, ultimately, the, who you want to be friends with, this closeness is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you take it through the means of the human feet, figure of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa or Sayyidina Ibrahim, who is the Khalid. Okay, that's the first point. Uh, the, and related to that is the hadith which I did mention last week, which where the Prophet ﷺ says, "Ashad the nas balaan al anbiya thumma al amtha thumma al amtha." He says the most tested of all human beings will be the prophets, and then those that are most like them. As I said, for every Musa, there's a Fir'aun. You take this path, you will find your own Pharaoh who will be. Um, and, 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 and I'll relate to another hadith that you don't need to be a pharaoh. There are, there are going to be, there are going to be people who are going to be, um, uh, raised with the pharaoh, with the pharaohs on the day of judgment, and they have no responsibility except their wives and children. They will be constant, they will be raised among the pharaohs. Why? Because they abuse their wives, they abuse their children. And that's really, really scary. So, leading from that point, um, Let's go to who we mentioned Abu Bakr Siddiq as being the beloved of uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now he was the most tested of all of the companions. And we know this from the story of the ifk, the story of the accusations that were made against his daughter, Sayyidatina Aisha radiallahu anha. So there were accusations made about her and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam distanced himself from her until Allah gave the command of, of, to clear, clarify what had happened. So he, he left it in Allah's hands. And during that time, she became ill. Um, and so did Abu Bakr Siddiq. The, 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 the pain of this, this distance from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, 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 was killing them. It was really, really uh, destroying the, and, Sayyidina, Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha, when she tells the story, she says nobody was tested like Abu Bakr and his family. And this is really important. Why? Because 
if you're to face the test, some of the tests that we face, the greatest of those tests are not going to be when we walk out in the street and we get attacked. Uh, I remember as a, a young 15-year-old uh, going to, to the mosque, and part of the reason I used to go to the mosque was because there was a wonderful Bengali imam who nobody liked. He was treated badly by the Muslim community, and he was treated even more badly by everybody around. He had, didn't speak a word of English, he didn't speak a word of Urdu, and he was in a Pakistani community that just didn't appreciate him. And I loved him. Uh, I couldn't speak Bengali, um, and I couldn't somehow we couldn't commute but he always managed to commu communicate to me that um he wants me to take him to a post office or he wants me to walk out into the street with him why because all the skin local skinheads used to attack him and he knew that when i if he came with me he'd have somebody to i was a 15 year old who wasn't scared of skinheads so i used to go out and get into a lot of fights but those fights were nothing that they were not tests in the same way that a test comes to the family. When you're tested by physical abuse from outsiders, where you're being beaten up, you know, that's small fry. But when you're tested by a relationship, your husband, your wife, your children, your uncles, that's the real most intense test. Abu Bakr Siddiq's test was in his family. Sayyidatana Fatima, Sayyidatana Aisha radiallahu anha, her test was in the family. He, she said no one was tested like the family. Abu Bakr, and of course they rise to the highest rank of 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 a significant al-Kubra. So that's the second, the, the third point is that the types of tests. Okay, let's return to the verse again. Ibrahim Rabbu bi Allah tested Ibrahim with certain commands which he fulfilled. Qala inni ja'iluk nas imaman, and I will make for you, um, I will make you as imam. So, what's this mean? is that the Millah, the religion of Ibrahim, would be the Imam, the religion of all of the monotheistic people. Why? Because at that time he was the Khalil rahman He was the one only human being who loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who believed him and understood him. And that's why he was considered to be an Ummah of his own. So as this man, this great patriarch of all human, of all the monotheistic religions, of all of the, of the, the, the righteous people who know the connection with Allah, he becomes the Imam. What does an Imam mean? Al Imam man yuqtada bihi is the one who is followed. So, um, uh, we follow the Millah of Sayyidina Ibrahim. That's why every day the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa recommended that we say, Asbahtu ala fitratul Islam. We have risen. We have woken. We have, this morning we have found the state of natural um, submission. Ala fitrat al Islam. Wa ala kalimat al ikhlas. And the word of truth. What's the word of truth? La ilaha illallah. Wa ala deen al nabiyyina Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And on the way of the religion of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa ala millat abina Ibrahim. And on the milla, on the religion of our father Ibrahim, Hanifan, Musliman, wa ma kana min al-mushrikin. And you should say this three, ta three times. Um, and, Every every child, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, uh, this hadith is related by in, in Sahih Muslim. It says, "Ma min mauludin illa wulid ala hadhi al-milla." Nobody is born except on this milla, meaning the milla of Sayyidina Ibrahim. Every child is born on the milla of Sayyidina Ibrahim, according to this hadith. Uh, and the hadith goes, "Hatta you hatta you bayinu anhu lisana," until he stays on this until he's able to articulate. And he has language and conceptualize, the ability to conceptualize. In other words, he's naturally on the middle of Ibrahim. And then only then does he adopt either the way of Ibrahim through, in our case, the, fo the following of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or he rejects it. And that's why if you reject Hajj, you may as well die as a Jew or a Christian or anything else. Because the middle of Ibrahim, of Ibrahim is in the deen of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, so this is the, the Millah that he becomes the Imam. So let's go back to the verse. And I've made, Allah says, I've made you as the Imam. And how, what, what does uh, um, Sayyidina um, Ibrahim reply? And from my offspring. And the answer to that is from his dhuriya. And for this, we have about five or so minutes until Maghrib arrives in, in, in Glasgow. I'm going to read what Ibn Kathir, the description of, of 
the Bushra that came to Ismail, uh, okay, about Ismail, to the mother of Sayyidina Ismail, which is Sayyidina Hajar, and to that came to Sayyidina Ibrahim about his wife Sayyidina Nasara and the the children of, of Sayyidina Nasara. So he describes that when um, uh, uh, Ibn Kathir describes how that when she, he, when Sarah told Ibrahim to um, have conjugal relations with with the the, the, the slave girl, to, to uh, he did, uh, and and as a result she became pregnant. And when she she had this this light growing inside her, she she became uh, raised in status from uh, an Egyptian slave girl to now the the mother to be of the prophets. Uh, and this caused some difficulty uh, in the relationship between the, the, the families, and as a result, she ran. She fled because she realized that Sayyidina Tanasara was not happy about this, and he describes how she ran to a well. Um, so she stayed there by a well. And then an angel appeared. She said, and the angel said, do not fear. For in Allah Jail min al Hadil Ghulam al the Hamilti Khairan that the that this child that you're carrying, Allah has promised greatness. Wa Amraha Biraju and he commanded her to return. Wa Bashar wa Basharaha and Nasitalid Ibn. She will have a son and to wa tasmihi Ismail and she should make name him Ismail. So um this was the um the Bushra, so to speak, that's referred to one of the Bushras that's mentioned, Women Dhuriyati, he's already received this great, 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 great glad tidings. However, it also refers that when Satan, when he was given after the after the he was told to command he was commanded, so the same Bishara, he, he was given this Bishara behind uh Walama Walad Ismail Oh Allah Ibrahim and Yubashir Hu bi Ishaq. Ibrahim was given the news that that he was gonna have gonna have the son Ishaq, Min Sarah. And when he received this, he fell in prostration to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says that he's going to, they're going to be great um, offspring from the, the from Ismail. And likewise, from this child, you will have many, many children, and twelve of them will be will be uh, great. And each one of them will be the leader of one of the great tribes. Now, the classical understanding of this it refers to the twelve children of the, of Ismail of, of Yaqub, who are the twelve tribes of Israel. However, Ibn Kathir and many other scholars refer link this to actually Sayyidina Ismail. Um, uh, there's reference in the Hadith to twelve um, imams uh, um, uh, among them uh, descending from Ismail, and there's different interpretations who these twelve imams are. Uh, and of course, there's a group of of the Muslims who say these twelve imams are Sayyidina Ali, Sayyidina Hassan, Sayyidina Hussein, Sayyidina Ali, Zainal Abidin. Sayyidina Muhammad al Baqir, Ja'af al Sadiq, and we know the 12, and others say, based it on a hadith where um, it refers to Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, uh, Umar bin Abdul Aziz. And these are kind of sectarian discussions which we're not going to need, don't need to go into it. But what we do know is that from all of these indications, that the there's great blessing that descends from both. And that's what's referred to in the verse. Women dhurriyati qala la yanala ahdid thalimin. But my promise is not within the reach of the evil doers. That's Yusuf Ali's translation. And uh, Dr. Abdul, Abdul, Dr. Muhammad Abdul Halim, he says, my pledge does not hold for those who do evil. Now, what we learn from this, and this is the final point that I think I can make on this particular verse, is that what's meant by my promise here, Ahdi, it means Rahmah, is that Allah's mercy will has been promised, but it's not been promised to the, the wrongdoers from your offspring. So you're not destined to have this great blessing simply because you're an offspring of Sayyidina Ismail. That doesn't happen. Um, however, um, it's by divine blessing, so to speak. And we know that the divine blessing will come through the offspring of Sayyidina Ismail and through the offspring of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
but that's what uh, that's one of the, the points with the refer. So the ahd here, in some is some call, some scholars say it was uh, refers to rahma. Others say prophet or nabuwa. Others says or imama. Um, uh, and Ibn Abbas is late. Uh, said imam, imam Ibn Abdullah Ibn Abbas is imam. Walaysalidhalim an yuta'a fi dhulmihi. But what's understood from this this collective understanding of this verse is that the imam is an imam. And you do not um, obey him uh, because the promise is not simply because of his imamat, but is because of his imamat and justice. And that you follow him in what is just and whatever he does, which is again, which is dhulm, you don't follow him. And this is Ibn Abbas's interpretation of this particular verse. And then I'm going to read the next verse, but time has run out for us to here in Glasgow to to, to comment on it, but I will read it because it kind of summarizes uh, the last two two lessons and inshallah sets the, 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 the point for next week, which is what the, this verse we will, will be out of the verse that we'll study. Well, let's continue. And we have made this house as a mathaba, um, which he describes, uh, Yusuf Ali says, as place of assembly and security. In other words, it's a mathaba, it's the place you yearn to go. And I'm going to end with, with a couple of stories of how this verse um, relates to, 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 to people. And I'm going to give stories from my personal experience. Um, one is my uncle. Um, we, we, we know him, we knew him as Uncle Sonny. Uh, his real name, of course, was Hassan. Um, um, married to my aunt, uh, and uh, I loved him dearly. He was a real joker, uh, and he 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 wasn't known for his outward act, outward appearance of Islam. I knew him as a, a great man. He prayed, but he didn't do. He wasn't known for beyond that. When he was um, diagnosed with cancer, they everyone knew he was ill. They said, "We have some bad news, uh, Sonny." Um, you've got cancer and it's terminal and it's very, very far gone and you're not going to survive and you're not going to, it's not going to be long. He smiled and he says, Alhamdulillah. This is to a non-Muslim doctor. He says, Alhamdulillah. Now I'm going to watch. And they just smiled. They knew he wasn't going to make it. He then went back, got back into bed and spent the next few weeks sick in bed. And on the day when he was supposed to go to the doctor to get his letter of um, letter of what it, fitness to travel, got out of bed, put in his best clothes, went to the doctor, says, I feel fine, doctor. Doctor looked at him, yeah, you're fit to travel. Back, got straight back into bed. Alhamdulillah, he got to Makkah and he died. Um, and his wife, uh, Auntie, Auntie Aisha, oh, sorry, Auntie Khadija, um, Alhamdulillah, she said, all of the days we were there, every janazah there was... 10, 15, 20 people, except the day that he, her husband died, um, he was the only one. It was like. So, and the other story is, is something that happened to my father, is that when he went for Hajj, um, there was a guy there who arrived with a Texan. He literally was a Texan, Pakistani origin, but he had a 10 gallon hat, is that what you call them? A massive American hat. And he, ra he landed there and he says, So, what's all this Hajj business about? And on the way there, he was actually drinking. You know, he had no, there was no Islam in any way. So that says, well, you come for Hajj, you know? Did you not? I said, nah, I'm only here because I was on my way to uh, the Olympics and I couldn't get tickets. I heard you got there's a flight going to this place called Mecca, and, and somehow, and, he, and, and, and I saw you, and I thought maybe you could take me for take. Me. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, my father adopted him there and then, looked after him, took him for Hajj, and um, some things were just put in, and this is what's meant in that the inner spirit will pull you towards the towards the Kaaba. And we ask Allah Subhanahu to bless us by making this 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 Kaaba, this bait, mathaba, as a, that which pulls us 
and it pulls us back to the life of the Prophet sallallahu and brings us back to the middle of Ibrahim and that we're able to say this dua Asbahtu ala fitrat al-Islam wa kalimat al-Khas wa ala dina nabiyina Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa millat abina Ibrahim hanifa muslima wa ma kana min al-mushrikin wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Allahumma iftah lana bil khair wa akhtim lana bil khair wa ja'al waqib umurna bil khair biyatik al-khair wa al-afi inak ala kulli shayin qadir da'wahum fiya subhanakallah wa tahiyyatahum fiya salam wa akhir da'wahum an alhamdulillah الله رب العالمين فجزاكم الله خير إن شاء الله نكس بيكم كمتم السلام عليكم جزاكم الله خير إن شاء الله نستقبل السلام عليكم